All right, so uh, today <clears throat> we're going to continue our discussion of a two-stage OTA design and uh, and then hopefully we'll quickly transition to a new topic, uh, output stages. Before we do that, though, I wanted to just show you guys the, the statistics on the midterm. Uh, if you haven't gotten the midterm back, uh, I come to office hours today and I'll hand it to you. Uh, but let, let's look at this histogram. And the results are actually quite encouraging. Uh, you know, here we have score, and then here we have frequency. Certainly not a, a Gaussian distribution. Um, so the good news is that, you know, a lot of people got got it. If you look here, there's a bunch of people, about seven of you, actually about probably about a quarter of the class fall somewhere in this range, scoring above, let's say, 70 points. Uh, I would say that these people definitely uh, really understood the material and did a really good job on the midterm. Uh, so definitely an A for these people. Um, the average fell somewhere around 62. And since this is a graduate class, the expectation is that if you do average uh, in a graduate class, you're doing pretty good, right? So that you should get an A. So probably the, the threshold for an A will be somewhere around 60. Of course, I'm not going to assign a letter grade. This will just go into the, uh, the, the final grade calculation, but just to give you an idea of where you're at, if you did above 60, you should be happy, you're in good shape. Um, there is this large group of people here who scored quite a bit below uh, the average. And if you're in this group, good news is you're not alone. Uh, the bad news is that, uh, you know, you didn't completely understand the exam. And uh, I, I really want to encourage you guys to take time, look at the test, Come to office hours. Talk to me if a question's not clear, and uh, you know, and basically move you guys up into this region. And for that reason, I'm going to ask you guys to do the midterm as a homework, and uh, especially if you didn't do well. So if you if you got everything right and you just missed one question, you can just do that one question. Uh, but if you didn't score a very high score, and you you know definitely do this as a homework. Uh, don't be shy. Come to office hours. Talk to me if it's not making sense. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody can do this test with their eyes closed, and then we'll, we'll be in good shape to move forward into the final. Okay. Questions about this? Okay, good. So let's uh, let's kind of recap where we were last lecture. So last lecture, we started looking at a two-stage OTA. And it's basically, uh, first stage is folded cascode, which we know and love, uh, we've designed before. Uh, kind of unfolded to look more like a butterfly, right, to show the differential topology. And then we put a second stage on there. And as you'll recall, uh, the folded cascode has a dominant pole that occurs at this high impedance node. We add another stage, uh, and the other stage also will have a dominant pole so this amplifier is going to have stability problems unless we do something about it. Now let's just quickly recap why we add a second stage. What, what are the advantages of, this, of the second stage? All right. Obvious is to get more gain, right? We might design this folded cascode and we just might not be able to get enough gain out of it for the given swing that we want and so we add a second stage to get more gain. Um, is the amplifier going to get faster? Do we get more speed by adding a second stage? Anybody? Uh, Christian? No. Why not? <laughs> because I remember from last class. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you remember from last class? I don't remember exactly why. Was it we had to back cough? I don't remember exactly why. Okay. Anybody else want to give it a shot? All right. David? Well, if the speed is limited by slowing, it's pretty much dependent on the bias on the last stage, right? If it's okay. No that, more... That's a good point. Uh, but let's say it's not limited by slowing. Let's say we put in pretty small voltages. Say we're on low, very low supply voltage and slowing is, is not a concern. Would, would then two stages give us a faster amplifier? 
You would probably have more poles and zeros to play with to, to play with to, to play as a crossover frequency. Yeah, not necessarily, and probably not, right? So remember, if we had, so we've got our folded cast code, and it looks something like this, right? This is the unity gain frequency. And we know that when we close the loop on this, our 3 dB bandwidth is going to be some fraction of this unity gain frequency, right? So this is our folded cast code. Now, if we add a second stage, um, let's say it looks like this. So this is pole one, and the second stage adds a second pole, which is less than the unity gain frequency, right? Well, now, if I close my loop, let's say uh, over here, and try to get this bandwidth that I was getting before, let's say this is the minus 3 dB bandwidth, then I see the full phase shift from one pole and a second pole. So by this frequency, I see about 180 degrees phase shift. If I close the loop, I build an oscillator or a latch, right? So this won't work. I can't get the same speed unless I can somehow move the second pole, right? Uh, the brute force approach we talked about was to narrow band the amplifier, right, where we now introduce Well, that didn't even quite do it, right? Even back off a little bit more. So this is a new pole, let's say P1 prime, that we either move this original pole way to lower frequency, or we introduce another pole, which is very low frequency, and now our unity gain frequency occurs before this second pole. And so now we can apply feedback and get this bandwidth but clearly this is much less bandwidth than we would have gotten here, right? So adding a second stage doesn't give us more bandwidth. In fact, we have to fight hard to get back our original bandwidth. And the technique we talked about last class was pole splitting, which in fact moves this pole back and it also moves this pole forward. And what we need to do is move this pole beyond the unity gain frequency, right, with some margin, factor of two or three, okay? How does pole splitting move the second pole intuitively? All right, so look at this circuit. So pole splitting, we introduce this compensation capacitor, right, this Miller capacitance. We know how it moves the first pole, right? How does it move the first pole? Okay. Christian, want to take another stab at it? That's what I remember. <laughs> the, the the capacitor is Miller multiplied, so it gets it's seen as a bigger capacitor, and so it decreases the second pulse frequency. Uh, the first pulse frequency, I mean. All right. How about the second pole? How does it move the second pole? All right. I mean, it's kind of a shunt feedback, so it reduces the impedance of the node. Exactly. That's the way we looked at it last lecture. So. This capacitor is a big capacitor, so at the second pulse frequency, it, it almost looks like a diode-connected transistor, which lowers the impedance of this node, right? And this only, the beauty is that this only happens at high frequency. At low frequency, this is still a high impedance, so we get lots of gain. It doesn't hurt our DC gain, but at high frequency, this thing tends to look like a diode, and therefore, the second pole moves to higher frequency. Okay, any questions about that? All right, well, last lecture we also looked at a few different ways of compensating this. So first of all, we said this is a nice place to put this capacitor, but the problem is it introduces a zero, right? And because the GM of this transistor is not that high, the zero frequency is not that high, and therefore we get a phase lag from a right half plane zero. And so we introduced the series resistor to move this zero, right? And we talked about moving the zero out to infinity so that we get rid of it. Remember, it was the analogy was move your, your bad neighbor as far away as possible. Move him to infinity. Um, so that, that's one technique. Any other approaches for moving this zero that you guys can think about? What other convenient frequencies could you pick? Okay. 
that's one of the poles. Like, okay, will that will that work? It's bad in terms of face wise, but it's good in terms of the gain you get. Why is it bad in terms of face? Because you lose the face twice. You lose because it's a pole and it's a right off lens. Exactly right. So, the approach of moving this right on top of the pole, even though it flattens out your magnitude response, it doesn't help with the phase response at all. Okay. To the lap off plane and sit on another pole on the other side, not lose <laughs> there. Okay, things are getting complicated, right? Maybe you can do that. It's a nice little master's project. But uh, the two obvious places are right on top of the pole or to infinity, right? If you put it right on top of the pole, it's not going to help your phase, it will help your magnitude response. But also, even if it were a left half plane zero, what would be the other issue with putting it right on top? Think back a, a few lectures, <laughs> pre midterm times. <laughs> yes? very well to make it sit on top of one another. That's right. They're not going to perfectly balance each other, they're not going to perfectly cancel, and so you're going to get a pole zero doublet. And that, if you're not careful, if the resolution with which they cancel each other is higher than the settling resolution that you want, the settling time will then get dominated by this pole zero doublet instead of your unity gain frequency times F, which is what you're hoping for. Okay? Questions or comments? Okay, let's talk about biasing this thing because, you know, in, in my experience, analog circuits are easy until you start to bias them up. <laughs> Once you try to bias them, they're a nightmare. Anybody look at this and talk about some potential problems with biasing this device? Let's just say we know how to bias the folded cast code. We've talked about that already, right? Now I add a second stage. What do you think? Can we zoom in on the schematic a little more? Thank you. Let's zoom in on the second half. Let's say this half. Okay, perfect. So now you guys can see it. What's the issue with uh, putting in the second stage? The, the input of the second stage is endless because you have to buy that. You probably will use like whatever capacitor, coupling capacitor, whatever to buy that. Can I use a coupling capacitor? Maybe, but what, let, let's talk about what the point you raised. Okay, so the point you raised is this gate voltage, right, needs to be at the proper DC voltage to produce the right current. And right now it's just hooked up to a high impedance node, right? So nothing is controlling the voltage at this node. Therefore, we, you know, this device could easily be at VDD or VSS, right? So we need some loop, you know, and, and maybe we'll, we'll take care of that perhaps with our common mode feedback loop, right? We're going to need to establish the common mode voltage here anyway. So perhaps we can also use that to fix the bias of that. Okay. Any other problems? Okay, I mean, I think you also have some problems with the offset because the second stage to move the the output to zero exactly for the inputs to be zero, you need to have a volt a specific voltage on the B M two B, which is different on that of M four B. M four B. So M four B is a cascode. Yeah. Yeah, I think what you're talking about, again, could be taken care of with our COM mode feedback loop. So that's not necessarily a problem. An offset would be a difference, right? It would be that these two sides would not be symmetric, right? Let me zoom out a little bit. So we would get an offset if the, the paths to the output were not perfectly symmetric, right? And the differential output voltage will be zero if everything matches well. Agreed? Yeah. So so differential is not an issue. Differential offset is not an issue. It's differential offset just comes down to matching. All right. Any other problems? Well, let, let's actually I'll give you guys a, a hint. What's again back to my original question. What's the benefit of the second stage besides more gain? Okay, Lee. 
better swing. Okay, and what do you think of the, the second stage, the way we've biased it up? Are we going to get better swing? What's the, what's the limit of the swing for this device? What's the highest voltage I can hit and the lowest voltage I can hit? Uh, highest is VDD minus VDSAT. Okay, and the lowest? lowest. Say this is reassess as ground. Okay, think of the easy answer. Don't think of what's happening at the gate. Let's just say the gate can go to the right voltage. Is it just VDSAT? Yeah, it's also VDSAT. Well, so I'd like to make VDSAT as small as possible, right? 100 millivolts maybe? That'd be great. Can I do that? How much headroom do I need to keep these devices alive? Clearly I have a conflict here, right? I've got... Basically I introduced this stage because it has a good swing, but actually the VGS is VT plus the overdrive voltage, right? So if I make the overdrive voltage too small, I'm going to creep on the headroom of these guys and maybe lose, right? Put these guys into triode region, in which case I lose my gain. So clearly this is not so simple as we made it look, right? I have to make the overdrive voltage large enough in order to bias up this stage, okay? So if I make the overdrive voltage large enough, remember that the GM of the second stage is proportional to the current divided by the overdrive voltage. So if the overdrive voltage is too large, I have to compensate with more current to keep good gain on the second stage. So that forces me to consume more power on the second stage. And so it's not a very easy thing to add the second stage. Uh, I'm going to lose swing because I have to make my overdrive larger, and I'm also going to be forced to consume more power to keep the same gain. Okay, so that's what I meant about Analog circuits are easy until you try to bias them, right? Just keep adding stages, get more gain, stabilize it, it's beautiful, and then you say, okay, how am I going to bias it up? And you realize you're in trouble, okay? Anybody think of a solution to this problem? Yes, Sang. Put a thrust follower up to the first stage. Okay, you could do that. Uh, so kind of a level shifter, in essence, right? You just somehow level shift here. And in which case, you would need to bias up your level shifter so you'd have more current consumption. So you can see that, actually, you have to burn the current anyway, right? It's either going to be burned here or it's going to be in your level shifter, right? I'll give you guys a hint. What if this is, again, a switch capacitor building block? Well, same idea. Instead of using a level shifter which is active, use a capacitor as a level shifter, right? Kind of going back to your idea. We can't just simply AC couple because the DC gain would go away, right? But we can charge a capacitor up to some DC voltage and just use the capacitor as a battery over one cycle. The battery's large enough over that cycle, it'll hold its voltage and it won't affect anything. So I would charge up this capacitor to the right voltage and uh, it would act like a level shifter. Okay, um, let's talk about the common mode biasing. How many common mode feedback loops do I need to make this thing work?
Anyone just want to venture a guess? Is it one or is it two or is it four? <laughs> Anupama, would you want to take, take a guess? Two. Why two? They didn't want to. Okay, that's a reasonable idea. Uh, we have two high impedance nodes, right? So we need to stabilize both of them. Well, actually, it turns out we can get away with one. And the reason is the second stage is not fully differential. Second stage is pseudo differential. So it does not have common mode rejection. So the common mode of this stage also appears at this stage. If I had used a tail current source for the second stage, I would have common mode rejection, and I would have to have two separate common mode feedback loops. But as drawn, I can get away with just one common mode feedback loop. Okay, And here is the common mode feedback loop, actually. Here's one way to do it. Let's zoom in on this schematic. So you can see that V output A and B are the outputs of the amplifier. I sample them through these capacitors, right? This is our voltage division. And this point, as we've seen over and over again, is the right, is the common mode voltage. I initialize the capacitors to some given initial state. And then if this point moves at all, it moves only in response to a common mode shift after I set it to the desired point. So now this point is the common mode voltage of my output. I compare it to uh, basically compare it to what I'd like it to be, form an error signal, and somehow take that error signal and apply it back to my amplifier. Uh, let's look at the approach that we used for uh, before. Th the approach we used before was we take the outputs from here and just tie them to this node and use this node directly as our common mode feedback point, right? Now I'm taking the outputs here. Why can't I just take some capacitors like this and build a common mode feedback loop? Right? As this point shifts up, I adjust my current. As it shifts down, I adjust my current. Shouldn't that stabilize a common mode feedback loop in the same way? Yeah, you want to use a mic? Now you have positive feedback. Yeah, so David here is very familiar with common mode feedback loops. He's been wrestling with them <laughs> all week. And he's absolutely right. Remember, I have before, I just had phase inversion, right? Now I've got a second phase inversion through my second stage, so this connection here is actually positive feedback. If I adjust this up, that actually pushes this voltage up as well. And so this won't work. So that's why we've introduced this amplifier. All this amplifier is doing is inverting our signal, right? And so this is you know nothing fancy here. This is a differential amplifier mirror the signal and I produce my error signal here and in fact uh, instead of connecting this point to the control voltage what we do instead is we can connect it here by just pushing extra current in and to and out of this node we accomplish the same thing and the nice thing is that this point is a low impedance point because of this Casco transistor right this is low impedance, so the output of this amplifier, which is a high impedance, can drive that low impedance point. So it's a very convenient way of doing it. Yes? The problem with the previous page was a uh, composite feedback on common mode. What if the center point of capacitor not the top but the bottom current source? Would that make a negative feedback? Yeah. U using this source? Um, I think you're going to get the same problem here or here. Well, no, 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 you're right. You could do it that way. That would work. So common mode feedback loops, there's lots of ways of doing them, and there really isn't a right or wrong answer. 
so this let this just be as an example. Uh, but there are a couple of cute things in this example which which I want to point out. Uh, so first of all, why use a cascode current source here? Why not just use a simple current source? that's easy. We just want to really pick up the differential signal, right? We want to minimize common mode signal to differential conversion because that would produce an offset in our amplifier, right? So this cascode just improves the common mode rejection of this amplifier. Okay, well, this is a mirror here, right? You guys all recognize it's a mirror. What's this transistor doing here? give you guys a hint. What are some problems with mirrors? It makes the both M5 transistors see the same drain source voltage. Very good. We want to minimize the systematic error in the mirror, right? One of the sources of a systematic error in a mirror is the VDS is not matching, just the DC voltage being different. And if I had avoided this transistor, this device would have operated with a different voltage on its drain than this transistor. This transistor's drain is connected to this point, and this point is V bias 3 plus a VGS of M6, right? So here I introduce a fake M6, match to the other one, tie it to also V bias 3, and so now this drain node is exactly at the same voltage as here. That minimizes the systematic error in this mirror. Why do I care about a systematic error in the mirror? Let's say the mirrors missed or had a 10% mismatch. Who cares, right? Is that going to affect anything? I guess the other art of doing an analog circuit design is knowing when to care and knowing when not to care. Or let's say knowing when to worry and when not to worry. Because if you worry about everything, there are simply too many issues. You'll go crazy. <laughs> um, but if you don't worry enough, something will bite you. So you've got to know when to worry and when not to worry. So should I be worried about, I mean, why did the designer of this op amp bother to add this device? Must have been a good reason, right? So what's the good reason? <coughs> All right. So anyone except for Amin? <laughs> All right, great. Um, because you're feeding back a current, and so if you mismatch it, then, um, for example, if you have 10% error, then you might have 10% error in your feedback. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Basically, I want these voltages, when they're equal, to be no current coming out of here, right? If these voltages are equalized, I want the feedback to stop. I've reached the right value. But if I have a systematic error here, then this current mirrored over here will not match this current for a zero input, and therefore I will have an output current which will then move me away from the desired output. So a mismatch here translates into <coughs> an offset in the common mode voltage. And to make that, you might say, oh, big deal, I'll just adjust this voltage a little bit, right? I'll go into SPICE and kick this up 10 millivolts. Why is that a bad, a bad idea? Yes, Jesse? Your process variations will determine that voltage. Exactly right. <clears throat> Maybe it works in SPICE with one model corner, but over process and temperature, it's not going to work. This, though, will work over process and temperature. So if you have a systematic error, 
you can't take care of it with you can't necessarily take care of it with a systematic offset in, uh, 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 you guys get the point okay all right so this is a nice circuit there's lots to 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 learn from this the techniques used here um, let's also talk a little more about compensation because that's where we ended the lecture so last lecture we talked about one way of taking care of this uh, was to use this resistor here and remember the what, what value for the resistor did we want to move it to infinity one over GM that's right so you can think of many ways of building using a, actually a transistor right to implement this resistor it doesn't have to be um, a linear resistor but what, what what are some problems with using a transistor bias okay let's say that uh, I design a biasing circuit and I bias it so over process and temperature the GDS of the device and triode is matched to the GM of the transistor we know we can do that all right any issues with using a resistor and the feedback loop made of a transistor okay you want to use a mic so people at home can hear yeah you? it's long linear yeah, it's nonlinear, right? It's not a perfect resistor. It's a device in triode region, and we know it's going to have nonlinearity. Does that matter? Right? We're designing a precision op amp, right? And now we put a nonlinear resistor in the feedback loop. Is that going to mess things up? We have a problem here, right? If we use a linear resistor, then it won't match over process and temperature. Well, that's probably okay, because instead of having a zero at infinity, if the matching is, let's say, 10%, the zero moves a factor of 10x higher. Okay? So maybe that's not too much of an issue. But if you look at the schematic of an op-amp, you know that people still use a transistor for this resistor. So why is it that the res the nonlinearity of that transistor doesn't seem to matter? It's nonlinear with the, the the bias voltages, but the bias voltages are constant. So you wouldn't, unless you have a high voltage swing on on the side. Well, that's you won't see that. that's what we care about linearity. When you have a high swing, right? Let's say this voltage goes really high, this go voltage goes really low. Now the the voltage drop across this trans resistor is substantially higher than its DC value. But the GM also changes in that case. True. Uh, it's a good point. But what I want to get at is the nonlinearity of this resistor. What? Why is it that you might not worry about the nonlinearity of this resistor? You have a good point. When you have large voltage swings in here, this thing changes, but so does the GM. So if they're matching for one thing, maybe you don't even really worry about it, right? Well, you know what? If, if this voltage goes really high, the GM of this doesn't change that much, right? But if, you, if the resistance here changes a lot, for, at least for the high voltage swings, you might run into stability problems. I'll tell you guys why we don't worry about it. We don't worry about it because we're going to put external feedback around this whole thing. So if this is nonlinear, right, then yeah, it will introduce distortion. But when I close the loop with lots of loop gain, right, 50 dB, 60 dB of loop gain, I'm going to reject the nonlinearity of this accordingly. And so then it doesn't matter. That's why I'm using an op amp in the first place, right? I use an op amp, put feedback around it, and produce a very linear amplifier. But the point that we just raised about the bias voltage is shifting is actually a valid one. If you make this system stable at quiescent point and, and, and you don't check any other points, you might build an amplifier and find out that half a million dollars later, you built yourself a nice latch, right? Not an amplifier. Um, the reason is that, of course, as this voltage moves around, as Amin correctly pointed out, the GM changes, and so this resistance may not necessarily track the GM correctly, properly. So you have to make sure that you simulate phase margin 
over the entire output range that you care about. So don't check phase margin at zero output. Check it over the entire differential range. Okay, um, compensation. So this is one technique to get rid of the zero. But it's not trivial. We have to use a transistor. We have to bias it properly. Um, so a couple of other techniques that we looked at. Last lecture, we looked at this idea of unilateral, unilateralizing the feedback. So instead of using a source follower, we use a cascode transistor. Um, the advantage, remember, is if I use the source follower, the output swing would then get limited by my follower. So I avoid that problem by tying a capacitance to a cascode device, which is unilateral, which has no problem feeding back a current in this direction, but rejects feedback in this direction. And so this was a nice way of solving the compensation problem, but it has a pro couple of problems. One is slewing. All of a sudden now the current here in this branch limits the slewing rate as opposed to the current in my transconductance stage. So that means I've got to burn a lot of current here. The other problem we talked about was th the power, which is related. I have to burn extra power. And so the other compensation technique that we talk about, the Ribner technique, was let's actually use a cascode that's already in the signal path. That way we don't introduce any new current paths, less power, and this avoids the slewing problem. And also the matching problem that we talked about. The fact that if these currents don't match precisely, you get an offset voltage. Okay, um, so let's look at this amplifier and, and identify some points where we might do the compensation. Well, here is a cascode device. It's already in there. And perhaps I can compensate over here. You might ask, well, how does this work? Well, the reason this works is that it basically splits the pole and zero by because the gains for the feed-forward path and the feedback path are different, right? If I look at the feed-forward path from here to here, I have a gain that's quite low. It's this transistor, which is a cascode, so the voltage gain of this stage is low, and then I go to the output. My feedback path, though, um, has if, if so this is the so this is actually the gain in this loop here right it's determined by this transistor and this transistor on the other hand the other path through here the normal path not using this this uh, capacitor has a lot, a lot more gain because this is a high impedance node so this transistor at this node introduces more gain and this effectively splits the pole and the zero okay it's not as obvious as the other techniques that we've looked at. To actually analyze this is quite complicated. You get cubic equations and you have to make lots of approximations, but it is a very nice technique. Okay. All right, so speaking of techniques that require more complicated equations, there's also what's known as uh, nested Miller compensation. And nested Miller compensation says, you know what? If I have three gain stages, you know, it, nested Miller really makes sense on a low supply voltage. Instead of stacking devices to get high gain, I'm going to just have, let's say, three or four gain stages. And I'm going to use nest, com, net, uh, Miller compensation within the gain stages, but also globally when I have two or three amplifiers that have negative feedback. I'm going to use more Miller compensation. We'll talk about this in detail a little bit more towards the end of lecture, but just a couple of points. First of all, it's a lot more challenging. It's not simple two-stage design. And uh, it actually, maybe because it is so hard to design, it hasn't been used much. If you go look at the literature, there's lots of papers that discuss the equations and how to compensate it, but then you look for actual implementations, there aren't that many people who use it. My guess is that with low supply voltages creeping in, we might have to use these techniques more and more, even though they're getting more complicated. 
So we'll come back to this. All right, noise. So the question is, what does the noise of a two, how does the noise of a two-stage amplifier compare to the noise of a single-stage amplifier? We analyzed the noise of a single-stage amplifier in depth, right? And we found that ultimately the noise turned out to be KT over CL times some factors. And those factors had to do with the fact that we use current sources, PMOS transistors. They had to do with uh, the CASCO transistor contributing noise at high frequency. It had to do with the gamma of the transistor, and so on. The question is, I have two stages. I want to know the noise. Now let, let's zoom in on this schematic. Now what, what's, what's key is when you're doing analysis of noise, to keep things simple. And uh, looking at some of your midterm solutions, not all of you kept it simple, right? Um, if you tried to analyze the noise of that original schematic, forget it. I think it would take you, if, if you're the world's best algebraist, right, you can really do good algebra, I still think it would take you a week and several iterations to get the right answer. At the end of the day, your answer would be so complicated, you couldn't even interpret it. You'd have to integrate it numerically, in which case you've lost all intuition, right? So when you're doing noise analysis, you really have to make things simple. And this is actually the equivalent circuit for that huge two-stage OTA, right? All 50 transistors down to two. Because we know that all the biasing circuitry is going to add some noise, but if we do a good job, we can reject the noise. The only noise that we can't reject is the noise of our current sources. And yet, I still put in ideal current sources. Why did I do that? Well, because I know that I can, add, I know the noise of this device compared to the noise of a device with a real current source is going to be greater by 1 plus ratio V stars, right? We, we derived that in homework. So I know that at the end of the day, I can always bring back the noise contribution here by just adding a factor of 1 plus X, where X is the ratio of the V stars. Same thing here. So this is a, a very, very simple uh, model. And I'm not using this model to predict the noise. I'm using this model to have intuition for the noise so I can know what parameters are important in determining the noise. Why do I need to do that? Well, I need to check because in a one-stage design, I had to just make CL large enough so that KT over CL were small enough and I, were, and I was done. Question is, is the same thing going to apply here? Okay. So here's the model. This is the first stage. It's just a transconductance, right? No matter how fancy it is, at the end of the day, for a differential signal, it just looks like a transconductor. Second stage is already a simple transconductor. I include this important feedback element, CC, the compensation capacitor, my load. And I'm going to put this in a feedback loop, right? An external feedback loop, which takes the output, multiplies it by F, and applies it back to the input. Right? Why do I have a minus sign here? use a cap divider, right, to drive the input. Where does a minus sign come from? Last time I checked, the cap divider didn't have a minus sign on it. Yes? I take it from the other side. That's right. If I took the output here and connected it here, again, I'd, I'd build a latch or an oscillator, right? That's positive feedback. So clearly, I need to take the other side's output, which is negative, and that's why I get a minus. Okay, now this circuit is simple enough that you can analyze it. It's still not trivial, and I encourage you guys to go through and analyze the circuit. It's actually just two nodes. I have a node here and here. This node you can take care of with just this equation. And you do lots of algebra, and at the end of the day, this is the result you get. And again, you work really hard to put it into some clean form. So you know the output noise should be a, f a function of the noise generators, right, IN1, IN2, times some filtering function, right, 
This is the low pass filtering we get from the two stage amplifier times some resistance, right? V equals IR. And the resistance here, I've written it in terms of 1 over GM of M1. Now remember, if, if this were a single stage amplifier, I would this term would be gone, right? I would just have IN1. And because the output noise is the noise of N1 times the resistance of 1 over GM, I right away know that these two terms together are going to give me a KT over C, right? And then the factor F tells you that if you use feedback, the noise goes up by the feedback factor. So now I have a second term, which is the noise coming in from the second stage. Okay. So what we what do we do next? We take this, we square this, we integrate it over all frequencies, and then we simplify the answer. And in fact, the answer looks nice and clean. Let's just zoom in on the answer. So the answer has the beloved KT over C term, right? It has a term that has to do with the feedback, which tells me that, yeah, just like a single stage amplifier, if I increase the, if I make the feedback factor smaller, in other words, increase the closed loop gain, the noise goes up. It has the gamma of the transistor, right? And then it has this one plus factor. So this factor here, we can think of it as the noise from M2. Because if this were a single stage amplifier, this would have been the answer. Well, would it have been? No, it would have been CL here, not CC. So interestingly enough, CC plays a very important role in this two stage amplifier. CC plays the role that CL played in a single stage amplifier, right? It's determining the unity gain frequency, right? It's determining the noise. And so, and it determines the stability because by appropriately selecting CC larger than CL, we get the right phase margin. And CC, so therefore, is, is the most important parameter for a two stage amplifier design. And fourth, it determines the slewing rate didn't talk about that, but because CC is larger than CL, it's actually CC that you have to slew, not the load. And so CC is, is king in the two-stage amplifier design. So you can't just pick, pick CC for, with one consideration, such as slewing or, let's say, uh, stability. You also have to take into account noise. Okay, questions or comments? Well, let's, let's look at the magnitude of, of this second term here. Because remember, this second term is kind of the noise from M2. What's the magnitude, give or take? Is it on the order of 1? Is it on the order of 1 tenth? Well, it's roughly on the order of F. Because remember, last lecture we found that CC was, you know, a little bit bigger than CL to get stability. So this ratio here is, let's say, on the order of a half or so, half, a third, whatever, times F. So really, if you've got a high-gain amplifier, F is small, which means this term is small. Why is it that the second stage is not contributing that much noise? Maybe somebody who took 142 will know the answer. Okay. Because the noise from the first stage is really gained up, it just overwhelms the noise that produced by the second stage. Exactly. It's, it's simple. So the noise of the first stage here actually to the output goes through the gain of M2. And so this definitely dominates the noise. The noise of M2 just flows to the output. So if we think of these noise sources as input referred, this one gets input referred by the GM of just M1 this noise source gets input referred by the voltage gain here and the GM of M1. So this contributes a lot less noise at low frequencies. Right? At high frequencies, um, the gain of M1 drops right considerably, and so then gain of M2 drops considerably, and then you find that M1 and M2 might be contributing almost the same noise. So just like a cascode transistor, at high frequency the picture changes. 
but fortunately due to the filtering effect the total output noise is not affected too much even though we took the noise of this into account okay so that pretty much concludes our discussion of a two-stage amplifier um, and we're going to start a new topic All right. so the new topic is uh, output stages it's a very important topic um, we're not going to spend too much time on it it's it's again one of those it's kind of a specialized topic if you if you are in a situation where you need to design an output stage there's a lot to learn there's a lot of papers to read but it is kind of specialized knowledge so we're not going to spend too much time on it let me just remind you guys of what we mean by an output stage well remember if you look at the op amps that you learned about in let's say 140 or class that you took it was always a GM stage uh, followed by maybe some more gain stages with some compensation right followed by a buffer or an output stage so what so in this class we kinda got rid of this guy right we said you know what for switch capacitor circuits and a lot of other applications also you'll you'll see GMC filters I don't really need this output stage it's not buying me anything in fact potentially it's increasing the noise so I'm gonna get rid of it when do we need it That's an easy question, right? I could go to one four. I could go to forty and ask this question, and I'm sure a lot of people will raise their hands. So don't be shy. <laughs> don't feel stupid. It's always good to question the fundamentals. When do I need an output stage? Why bother? Join the low resistance. Okay, that's fair. Um, do I really need it? What kind of load resistance would I need it for? Resistance more than the than the output resistance without the yeah. Output uh, fair point. If I need to drive a small resistor, then that will load down my amplifier, right? And it'll reduce its gain. I need to buffer it. Simple as that. Other reason I might need a buffer, uh, in fact, we'll look at some applications when you can get away with a buffer, when you can't. If I can get away without using a buffer, I will. It may turn out that the dry load I'm driving is sufficiently large that it maybe doesn't load my stage. Let's say this is the high impedance node, and maybe this is moderate. Let's say this is on the order of 10K. And so if I need to drive a load that's 50K, maybe I say, hey, why not just connect it here, right? The other reason I might use an output stage is to handle large currents. So these could be larger transistors, they could have special thermal protection, they're designed to drive the large currents that I need in certain applications. So you're absolutely right, I want to drive a resistive load, that's when I use an output stage. Um, one example is if you have an RC filter and you're using an op amp, but uh, if you use a GMC filter, you don't really need it. Talk about that later in the class. Biggest application is loads. Um, why is it that our loads tend to be low impedance, right? If you're driving a video cable, it's 75 ohms. If you're driving a RF, let's say a cell phone kind of filter, it's 50 ohms. Uh, why is it that the, you know, driving the phone network, right? It's on the order of 600 ohms. Why do we have these low impedances when we associate them with systems such as phones and communication? If you think about it, you know, where, where did the phone network come from? The phone network came from people taking the telegraph network and converting it into a phone network. 
And so whoever designed the telegraph network, right, you're not going to go invest in all this money to put down a whole new network. You're going to use the network that they put down. So the telegraph guys had put down 600 ohm cables. Why do they use 600 ohms? Why do the RF guys use 50 ohms, right? A philosophical question. Because of impedance matching? Because that, that is the same order as the intrinsic capacity. Intrinsic exactly, capacity. yeah. So the idea is if I have a long cable, let's say it's a mile long, this cable is much, much bigger than the wavelength. So if I'm going to drive this cable, it doesn't just look like a long inductor and capacitor, right? It doesn't look like a, long, a big capacitor. Thank God, because this would be a very large capacitor, right? It would kill us. And it doesn't look like a huge inductance, right? There's a huge loop, mile-long loop, right? So it doesn't look like a huge inductance. In fact, it looks like a distributed circuit. And as a distributed circuit, it's a transmission line, right? And it has a characteristic impedance. And so when the guys who did the telegraph uh, lines spaced their wires, they spaced them, right? It was a balanced transmission line. They spaced their lines, something like log of D. The, the distance they chose gave them 600 ohms impedance. Okay? And so now I connect a resistor here. What value do I pick? I have to pick 600 ohms. Just because uh, uh, Ji Hoon, is that how you're saying? Yeah, Ji Hoon pointed out that I need to match to the transmission line because I don't want reflections on this line, right? If I'm operating this as a telegrapher, then I'm sending pulses down this line and these pulses reach the load, uh, if this is not matched, I get a reflection, right? Let's say it's less than 600, I get a negative reflection. And that comes back and interferes with all the other pulses. And then I get reflections, if, if I, my driver is not designed to match to 600 ohms, I get another reflection, right? Well, probably this reflection is not as important because the signal has propagated and become very small. But in order to minimize intersymbol interference, I need to match to 600 ohms. So my system needs to be able to drive 600 ohms. I know from transmission line theory that if I terminate with 600 ohms, no matter where I look on the transmission line, I see 600 ohms. That's another reason, because now I can in insert drivers anywhere. And as long as they're designed to drive 600 ohms, everything works. I don't have to worry. If I don't use 600 ohms, then every half wavelength, the impedance changes. And it goes from high impedance to low impedance, depending on when the standing wave ratio is on the line. Okay, so definitely if you're driving twisted pairs for phone network, you know, for Ethernet, if you're driving a high-speed data network, ISDN, again, the phone network, DSL, again, the phone network, coax cables, uh, all these applications require us to drive small resistive loads and certainly we can't connect these small resistive loads to our OTA. They kill our gain. The other issue is um, okay so they kill our gain. So what we say is we're gonna have an output stage. So here's our OTA and we just designed an OTA where the output stage was a common source amplifier. And let's say that I put this output stage here not so much for more gain. I put it here to get uh, more headroom. So I don't really care if I connect a 600 ohm resistor here. It's going to drive it, no problem. Is this a good idea? In other words, does the common source amplifier make a good output stage? So, for an output stage, I don't necessarily need voltage gain, right? So GM times 600 could be 1, could be 0.5. I don't care. I'm not doing this for voltage gain. I'm just doing it so that I can get good swing at the output, and I can 
deliver current to my load, enough current to the load. Well, let's look at the, because the voltage gain is just GMRL in this application, we zoom in here. Because the voltage gain is just GMRL, I can solve for a given value of GMRL, I can solve for ID, right? So V star is fixed, let's say it's 100 millivolts. AV, let's say it's 5 or 10 or 1,000, whatever you want. And then we plug in RL. And here's some, some numbers for you. Let's say a 200 millivolt V star. Let's say you're trying to get a gain of 10,000. And you're trying to drive 50 ohms. That means that you need 20 amps of current. <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? No one's going to let you do that. You're going to get fired from your job if you ask for that. Uh, it's just not physically possible because you're being really stupid, right? You're asking for all this voltage gain when you shouldn't ask for much. And you're trying to drive this tiny little 50 ohm resistor. This is really a lower bound on the current. You're going to need a lot more than this. This is just enough current to bias up your transistor. So you say, okay, well, maybe I just back off on gain. I'm not going to ask for a gain of 1,000. I'll just ask for a gain of 10. Still need 20 milliamps, right? Still might lose your job, right? Um, what's 20 amps times 50? That's 1,000 volts. <laughs> You're going to have to ask for a transistor that breaks down over 1,000 volts. The frequency response to that transistor is probably going to be a kilohertz. You're not going to get a high-frequency transistor. Um, so the, the lesson the, it, uh, of this is that if your load is large enough and your gains are modest, then you could use a common source <clears throat> output stage. Kilo-ohm loads, small voltage gains, 2, 1, 5, sure. Current consumption will be reasonable. You can do it. All right, questions? Well, <clears throat> the other issue with this is that this is the current you have to burn <clears throat> constantly. This is just the bias current. And so let's say we design this and we need a milliamp of current. That means that no matter what the voltage is at the output, I'm burning a milliamp of current. I've determined that I don't need more than a milliamp, right? Because if I need to more than a milliamp, I cut off. I can sink more than a milliamp, but I can only source a milliamp of current. So this current has to always equal the maximum current you could you need. Well, that's a really pessimistic thing, right? Maybe you only need this current one person at a time. So 99% of the time you're wasting a lot of current, right? We call this a class A amp output stage or class A amplifier because you ha you only <clears throat> the efficiency of a class A amplifier when there's no input signal is zero. You're dissipating a lot of power, right? What we really like is to dissipate no power when there's no input signal and only draw current when we actually need it not constantly draw this large current. So what we'd like to do, use is something like a class B amplifier. Okay. Um, so first of all, let's, let's use bipolar technology as an example. Output stages are more common in bipolar. Bipolar devices are good at driving lots of current, they have good current handling capability, they have low output impedance, they make good output stages. Of course we'll talk about CMOS output stages as well. The next thing you might look at is something like a source follower. What are the advantages of a source follower compared to this common emitter output stage? So let's look at the pluses and the minuses. What are some of the pluses?
think of think of 40. Think of the first electronics course you took. What are some things you like from a good buffer? Shuji? Low output resistance. Yeah, so this one has low output impedance. This one, and in fact, I can tune the current so that the output impedance is equal to the characteristic impedance I'm driving to get no reflections, right? This one has high output impedance. Okay. So here I might be forced to use a resistor in order to get, you know, let's say a 600 ohm resistor so that it's matched to 600 ohms when I load it. So I can fix that problem. What else? What's the maximum current I can source with this? There's no limit, right? As long as I can keep this transistor alive, I can keep raising the input voltage and source unlimited current. So this thing can source, let's put in current, current uh, in, in uh, quotation marks, unlimited current. How much current can I source here? Just the current source, right? So limited source current. How much current can I sync with this? Yeah, again, the current source. So the downside here is this has a limited sync current. How much current can I sync with this device? Again, almost unlimited, right? For all practical purposes. Okay, how about headroom? What's the maximum swing I can get out of this device? Well, I can saturate this transistor, right? Saturate meaning put it into, let's say, triode region, right? So the lowest voltage is VCE sat, a couple hundred millivolts. Uh, and then on the high side, this is also a current source. So I can also go all the way and saturate this current source. So this has good swing. Okay. What about here? Well, we all know that the swing is good on the low side, but it's bad on the high side. It's limited by this follower. So apparently, they're both good and bad, right? Well, let's actually talk about one more thing. What about bandwidth? Let's get somebody who hasn't talked this lecture. Frank? <laughs> Which one's faster? These are two horses and you're a betting person. Which horse would you bet on? <laughs> You're going to bet on War Admiral, or are you going to bet on Seabiscuit? <laughs> there was a special on PBS the other night. Anybody? Yeah, this is fast, right? Why is it fast? No, not, not slewing. We're not talking about slewing. <clears throat> We're talking about raw speed, small signal speed. Remember, this guy has lots of input capacitance, but it's bootstrapped. The voltage gain across this cap is roughly 1, so you pro pretty much don't see this capacitance. You do see this cap. This guy, though, you see the full capacitance, and you see this guy, Miller multiplied. So this thing introduces a pull at both the input and the output. And so if you're designing a multi-stage amplifier, and this is your output stage, 
you better worry about stability because this is going to add a pull. That's exactly what we did when we looked at the two-stage amplifier. If this is your output stage, forget about it. It's fast. It's going to be faster than unity, unity gain frequency, and of course you're going to check that, right? You're not going to just going to say, oh yeah, in 240 I learned this is fast. Uh, but more than likely it's not going to be a headache. You'll take care of it. So this is fast. This guy is slow. Of course you can make it fast by proper design, but it's going to, right, it's going to require some, some clever uh, circuit design. So neither one is really a good solution. If we look at the minuses for the source follower, um, the swing is a real issue, uh, and the sync current sync capability is an issue. Well, we can pretty easily solve the sync capability. One thing you can do is you can say, hey, this guy can source, this guy can sync, let me put them together. And not too surprisingly, people have designed output stages that look like that. So this is your output stage. <clears throat> this guy is your sync output stage. This is your source output stage. I'm going to have some circuitry in here that takes my input signal and splits it between these two paths. And uh, if you're interested in this, uh, Grain Meyer talks about this in detail. Anybody think of a problem with this output stage? Negative and positive side it gives different gains, so it's nonlinear. Yeah, it's extremely nonlinear. On the positive side, right, it's just a follower. On the negative side, it's a common source amplifier. And so it's its linearity is terrible. But again, if, if this is an op amp with hundred dB of gain, maybe that's okay. You put that you know, you put that loop gain around it and you straighten it out. Okay. What's more common, though, is to use a complementary device because a complementary device complements this device. So this device now can source and this device can sync. And the problem with the voltage gain is fixed because this is a follower and this is a follower. If the input voltage is positive, right, that tends to turn on this device and deliver power to my load. If my input voltage is negative, that tends to turn on this device, right, and turn off this device. So this is great. This is my output stage. A couple of followers. The FT of the P device is going to be a limiting factor, right? I have to make sure that uh, this device is fast enough. But otherwise, uh, it looks like a pretty good solution. Any potential problems with this? Isn't there a crossover? Distortion? Yeah. So if you've seen this before, you know that it has this crossover distortion problem. In other words, the input has to get large enough to turn on this device, right? If I go below a VBE, right, this is zero volts quiescent. So if I go below a VBE on this input, the device just cuts off, right? Likewise here. So this is the crossover distortion problem, and this is usually called the dead zone. Question? Yes. Yeah, why don't put uh, whatever uh, left shifter in front of that? Yeah, that's the solution, right? So we'll get there. So this back, if you're building a very um, high power stage, let's say, at 10 volts. And you might say, okay, I have a little bit of, you say, VBE on 0.7 volts of dead zone. Who cares? Again, I'm going to use feedback. I'm going to have feedback around the whole thing, and so effectively the dead zone is going to be smaller. No, because if this is an output stage, you really care about the large output voltage swing, right? So your, your input is going to be going over this whole range and every time it hits this, the output's going to clip. So instead of having this is your input, your output has to get large enough, right? So it's going to clip and then do this, right? And then it's going to die again, and then it's going to turn on, then it's going to clip. So it's going to be ugly. 
and these little guys introduce lots of harmonics and if this is like driving a speaker you're gonna hear these click 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 you're gonna hear it uh, so bad idea very bad idea and there's a simple solution right and the simple solution is somehow keep these devices on before we do that though let's talk a little bit about the efficiency of this guy if the input is zero you draw no current if the input is one volt you draw one volt over RL if it's ten volts you draw ten volts over RL so this in fact has a nice property it's a class B amplifier because the current that it delivers depends on the input signal. If the input is zero, the current is zero, you dissipate no power. So clearly this is going to be a much more efficient solution than the class A solution that we looked at, where you need to constantly draw current. Okay, and so the way we solve this dead zone problem is we introduce some level shifters And so these devices, these diodes, are 2 VBE. That's exactly what I need from here to here. I need 2 VBEs to keep these transistors on. And it looks like a nice solution. Let's say I drive it here. Looks pretty good, right? So. How much current do I need to run in this leg here? Can I run like a trickle current, let's say a microamp? Okay. One over beta times the output current you need. Yeah, but just very intuitively, even without equations, the amount of current I need to run here not only do I need to supply the base current of these transistors but also I want these to be on enough right but what does that mean well let, let, let's say that I'm driving a load on, on average I'm gonna drive 10 milliamps into and out of my load okay so in order to avoid this crossover distortion problem right I want to make sure that under all conditions, over process, temperature, everything, both devices are on, right? In which case, transfer function just goes right through the origin. So I'm going to make this current hefty enough so that under all conditions, these devices are on. I don't ever want to turn off one of the devices because then I get nasty distortion problems. And so I choose this current to be large enough, let's say half a milliamp or something like that, and that completely solves this crossover distortion problem. All right, we're going to continue with this next lecture.